Hello and welcome to this video where we're taking an overview of the new features that are available in Cubase 10.5. So some of these have their own videos because they need a fair bit more depth and those will be linked in the channel and I'll mention them as I go through. But this video will give you an overview of what's available in Cubase 10.5 and whether or not the upgrade is worth it for you. So let's jump right in. First things first, uh, one that I've actually made the most use of, even though it's uh, one of those trivial things, is the combined selection tool. So this allows you to use both object selection and range selection tool at the same time by turning this mode on. Now, in this mode, if your cursor is in the top half of the track, you are in range selection mode, as you can see there. And if you're in the bottom half of the track, you're in normal selection mode. This has been really really interesting and useful for me because I didn't use the race selection tool that much because often it was just a bit too much mileage to right click or select it whereas now it's possible to just have it on all the time. The only downside of this is you have to be accurate with your mouse because if you let's say we just wanted to move this part here in the normal way you have to be in the bottom half to move it around otherwise you are going to do a range selection now obviously sometimes you'll want to do that range selection so here selecting a couple of bars and then you can just move those out nice and easy which is exactly the strength of the range selection tool but having spent uh, 20 years using Cubase and not having to be that accurate it's a bit of a jump initially to having to do that and of course, sometimes, of course, you can turn it on and off. There's a keyboard shortcut for it. Or you can just um, get used to it, which is certainly what I've done. So covering some of the other functions which have got their own videos. First up, MIDI Retrospective Record, which has got quite a big upgrade. It now has its own button, which is visible by default. Uh, it has its own video. You can have a look at that uh, elsewhere on the channel. It's linked in the description. But in short, Cubase is always recording your MIDI input and this allows you to grab that nice and easily. So whether you've been playing along with Cubase in time or whether you've just been noodling around while it's in stop mode, that will be recorded and you can grab those great ideas you sometimes come up with spontaneously. There is the multi-tap delay plugin. So that's got its own video. It's available in the multi-tap delay. So we can load that up fairly quickly and there you can see it but that's got its own video there's quite a lot to this so while on the face of it it's a fairly simple plug-in it's got some nice features and there's lots of creative sound design etc you can do with that as well as it just being a functional delay plug-in with some nice touches so check out the video on that we've also got pad shop 2 so we'll just look at what pad shop 2 looks like so we see Pad Shop there in the instruments list. There's Pad Shop 2. Pad Shop 2 is, is also pretty immense, so that's hopefully going to get its own uh, video series when I've got time to do that. But it's certainly got a video giving you the highlights elsewhere on the channel. The link is in the description. So if you want to learn more about Pad Shop 2, I'd suggest you go and check that video out. As even though it's reasonably long it's only covering the very basics of this and just an overview of what's available to you there's the ability to import tracks from a project so that's been vastly improved so as we can see here if we go and pick a different project we can pick another project and then find out which tracks we can import there's a video on that elsewhere on the channel looking at it in a bit more detail but that's a hugely useful thing for any time you've got to import tracks from a different project or you want to do a remix of your own work or keep things consistent and the eq section so the eq section has had a bit of a boost most important thing is the channel comparison which again is covered in another video on the channel because it's definitely a worthwhile function Really useful. It's the kind of thing, it's, it's not a headline grabber. It's not the kind of thing that people are going to go, oh, that's amazing, but it really helps your workflow. So it allows you to compare the EQ of two different tracks nice and quickly. So 
as we'll see here, there's the high strings EQ and there's the acid riff and it allows you to see what's going on on two different channels at the same time and work on them, allowing you to do EQ techniques and settings much more easily than you'd be able to do if you have to flick manually between the channels. Now let's get back to some features which aren't covered elsewhere. So one of them, colouring in. People seem to be obsessed with colouring in. It's certainly not something I do a great deal, although you can see I've done some on here for reasons of another video that this project was involved in. But it's also possible to colourise your track channels and your uh, mix channels. So that's now under preferences. So if you go to user interface, track and mix console channel colors and then you can decide whether the tracks are going to be colored so if i apply that you'll see that the tracks now have some colorization and you can pick how much so if you want to go crazy yes you can go that mad with your colors or you can have them on a very minimal setting almost so it's not visible but also you can pick whether folder tracks are colored so there you can see those folder tracks get colored in and also the mix console so if i just apply that and then we go and look in the mix console you see now the mix console is also uh colored in whether or not that's for you i guess is is down to you but certainly there's sometimes when i have used uh coloring on tracks because certain instruments seem to uh appear to me to be a particular color so that can be useful although possibly not with the colors i've chosen and possibly not with the default palette which Steinberg uses, which has never really got on with me, but I guess it's partly because I'm colorblind, so some of them seem too similar, and then there doesn't seem to be enough choice, but that's a, a totally different argument. Now, really, really usefully on this, there is now a safe start mode. So this is something which I can remember asking for when, when Cubase VST first came out, which... Uh, must have been 20 years ago yeah easily so that was in that was in the mid 90s so now finally at long long last it is possible to start up without having to move a load of folders etc so let's just quit cubase a bad vst plugin can crash your session or you can just be in a situation where loading up all those plugins means you run out of memory so you may need to disable some of them, but you can't disable them because you can't open the program up. This is now possible by a keyboard shortcut which disables them. So in the case of the Mac, it's Shift, Option, Command. In the case of the PC, I believe it's Shift, Control, and Alt when you're running it. But when I launch Cubase, so here we see the safe start mode starting up and you can pick what you're going to do. So we can deactivate third-party plugins and we can also delete the program preferences. So often uh, on the Mac and also I found on the PC, sometimes the program preferences can be a problem. So you can disable them or you can delete them completely. But probably most importantly, you can deactivate all third-party plugins. So when you want to load up a project which has got too many plugins and maybe it's becoming unstable for whatever reason, you can do that just by deactivating these rather than having to go rename a load of folders and then rename them back to what they should be once you've solved the problem. So this makes it much easier and also allows you to test whether or not it really is the plugins are causing the problem or whether it's something else. So this, while again, it's only a small thing, it's really nice and easy to get that done and means people will be able to solve their own problems much more easily. AdTrack now has all the track selections in there. So if you use this mode, which uh, I'm not sure how many people do, but uh, if you do use this, then you've got access to all of these different things in a unified window, which is much nicer than it's been for a long time. So you can see all of those track types are available to you there. And as you move around the program, you will notice there are quite a few uh, windows which have been redesigned. So for instance, the audio mix down window is nicer than it used to be. Uh, it's a little clearer that what's happening and seems to be a little more consistent. And there are a number of windows around the program which have been redesigned. Again, nothing uh, night or day about them, but it just means your workflow is a little easier and simpler and you've got a little more consistency. So you're spending less time worrying about whether or not you've made the right settings, etc. 
Next up is overlapping audio events. Now, this is something which has been improved greatly with just a simple addition of a much more informative menu. When you have two or more events on top of each other on an audio track, the triangle gives you access to the menu, and here it clearly indicates which one is on top with the star, and it also gives you bar or time ranges, depending on which time base you have selected. And it's easy to pick the other one. So here I'm going to make square shot on top and you can clearly see that one's on top now. And if we want to change it back, we can change that nice and easily. So that works much more clearly than before. So even if you have nearly identically named audio files on top of each other, it's much easier to pick the one that you want and get that on top. Macro management has been improved with the simple addition of the move up and move down commands. That makes life much easier. So you can now edit the macros the way you want. If you've not used macros, I would strongly suggest that you, you do so. There's videos on the channel uh, to help you go through that and learn how to use them. But making them previously was a pain because if you put the commands in in the wrong order, you had to delete all the way back to where you were, which was just miserable. And again, this is a simple workflow improvement, which makes life much easier. So let's say we wanted to just move this one to the end. We can just do move down or we can move it up, etc. And now you can change it as easy as that, whereas previously we'd need to delete things. So if we wanted to move this up to here, we'd have had to delete these five, then recreate all those things, which was just so, so difficult and puts you off doing them. Whereas now, dead easy to do, really simple. Really can't understand why this wasn't done a long time ago, but there we go, it's there now. Another welcome new feature, but again, only a small one, is the ability to export video directly from Cubase. Uh, so here you can see a project where there is a video which is imported, which is another one of my Cubase videos. Uh, obviously, if you had instruments, etc., this would all apply, but this is just a simple demonstration of how it works. And you simply go to File, export and video and set your options and export the video just as you would do uh, an audio mix down but it exports video but as you can see here the file size is quite significant so i'm going to export the video fast forward through this section because it does take a fair while and then you can see the result Okay, so the export is finished. Uh, as is often the case with these dialogues, they've got bizarre things such as keep dialogue open, so you'd normally untick that, so it would close after you'd done it. But the export took about four minutes in real time. So obviously I've sped that up greatly for the purposes of the video, otherwise you'd all get bored and leave. But let's have a look at the file which has been exported and compare it with the source file. So here are the two files which uh, we're going to compare. So this is the export from Cubase 10.5. And this is the source video which I imported into the Cubase project. So this is HD resolution, so 1920 by 1080. This is the default resolution of a Mac or native resolution of a Mac, which is 2880 by 1800. So this second one has got a lot more information in it in terms of pixels. But you can see clearly this is this is a tiny fraction of the size. So this is one and a half gigs and this is under 100 megs. So I, I, I think there's some work to do here in terms of making this a usable thing because often you would want to just export this as a quick export to, uh, to send to a client, etc. But I think you'll need to import this video and then transcode it into something smaller for uh, clients using a tool such as Handbrake, etc. Because... Clearly, firing around two gig files isn't going to be particularly popular with a lot of clients. They're, they're going to want to have something uh, small and easy and quick to play. Uh, the last area where there's been some changes is the score editor. And that's, to be honest, that's not something I use a great deal anymore because uh, partly because my use has changed, but mostly because I'm using Dorico for the things I need to do in scoring, particularly now Dorico's got a uh, guitar tab, etc. in there. But we'll just cover just one of the things in there. So in the score editor, now when you move by default, when you move a note around, you can see this 
uh, ruler which appears above the bar. And if I move into the next bar, you can see that ruler move across to the next bar. And that's set by the division. You've got quantize set to, so you can see there it's in 16th. So it makes note placement uh, a fair bit easier to, to do. Uh, there's a few other minor changes, which I, I'm not going to go through, but they are fairly minor. It's certainly not a uh, room branch rejigging of the score editor, and it definitely shows its age compared to working in Dorico, but obviously not everybody can afford Dorico. And uh, the scoring is still functional, so obviously that's still something which is, is covered in my book, but the scoring in Cubase has always been the kind of thing where you can you can create a score from it, but... Now there is so much power in scoring editors, say particularly Dorico. It probably you if you use a, do a lot of scoring, you're probably not going to be doing that much in Cubase anyway. So that covers most of the new features in Cubase 10.5. And the final question is whether or not it's right for you to upgrade. Certainly for me, it's the smaller things such as the combining of selection tools and the EQ comparison that have been the biggest changes to my workflow and sped things up while I'm working day to day. Well, that could be different for you. And that may help you decide whether or not you want to upgrade. Obviously, if you get left too far behind, I think the price goes up a fair bit if you haven't upgraded in too many years, but not everyone keeps up with every version of the program. I have to because uh, it's my job and I pay for every upgrade. So this is one misconception. Often people think that I get all my software from Steinberg for free. Uh, I, I don't. I don't get discounts. I pay everything at full retail price. But I'm in a different position to everyone else because I need to keep up with all the new versions of all the software. Unfortunately, that's one thing that my limited income from YouTube actually covers. So thanks for watching these videos, guys, and subscribing, etc. because that means that come whatever time of year it is that Cubase comes out, the earnings pretty much cover me being able to upgrade uh, Cubase, which is which is a great thing. So uh, thank you for that. I say, I hope you found this video and the others on the channel about the features in Cubase 10.5 useful. And if you have, please like and subscribe as it helps the channel get recommended to other people. And I hope you've enjoyed it and thanks for watching.